D to be Trappy 96. You are the first. What's happening? What's good with you? What's on your mind? Y'all can ask any question. Any question. Any question you want to ask. Today's ask the mind plug any question. <laughs> what's going on? That's what's up. That's what's up. Where you at? Where in the world are you? Scotland. That's beautiful, man. That is what fucking beautiful right there. Fucking Scotland. Do they, are they, um, are they hip to the culture out there like that? Hip hop like that? What up, Dre? Andre the Poet. What's going on, Ed? They on hip hop out there like that? Trappy? Oh, you grew up in Brooklyn. So how'd you, how'd you end up in Scotland, man? I definitely want to go to Scotland. Scotland is a beautiful, beautiful country. So you grew up in Brooklyn, you ended up in Scotland. How'd you end up in Scotland? Scotland. Melly Mel 1280, thanks for tapping in. That's what's up. You, um, have you read any of my books? Have you read Raised by Wolves or Old Gangsters and Young Guns, or either, either my joints. Uh, I got other books, but have you read either of those? Married a Chick That Lived in Scotland. That'll do it. That'll do it. That'll do it, man. That's what's up. 
That is crazy. All the way from Brooklyn. What part of Brooklyn are you from? So you went to Scotland from Brooklyn. Talk about uh, cultural adaptation, like cultural adapting, culturally adaptive. That's what you are. Culturally adaptive. That you go from Brooklyn to Scotland. That's crazy. Baltimore History Channel, what's happening, man? What's goody? Oh, that's what's up, man. You got it. Uh, oh, you're from Bed Stuy. You can go from Bed Stuy to motherfucking Scotland, man. That's crazy. I don't imagine you get um, many visitors from home come checking you in Scotland. That's some shit right there. From Bed Stuy, Brooklyn to Scotland is crazy. OG Fezzy. Or is it Fizzy? Feezy. OG Feezy. That's that's beautiful though, man. Going from Brooklyn to Scotland. You know, most of the people in Best Stuy, they don't even leave Best Stuy. I know a lot of cats in my generation, they didn't leave Best They didn't leave. I used to be in Brooklyn back in the 80s. They didn't, they didn't leave Brooklyn. What's happening with you, Fez? Yeah, that's crazy. You said no visitors. They all in the pen or in the dirt. So you really know how fortunate you are. You really know how well you've done. Like It wouldn't matter what level you're living on for you to be so far removed from those outcomes. Man, shit, you won. You've won. That's a beautiful thing. You come back often or at all? No doubt. And if you've got a good woman on top of that, you've won. I know a lot of people with a lot of things, but what they don't have is a peace of mind and a good, a good mate. You know, they don't have that. And you were born in the Caribbean, where were you born? Oh, you ain't been back since 99? Oh, buddy, it's different. It's different, and it's more different than you can imagine or perceive from a screen, you know? Like, it's different, it's way different. Way different, bro, bro. Way different. It, it's, it's more nonsensical than you, than you can tell from your side, trust. What'd you say, Ed? What's going on? You see the news with Trump? Do you think they may try to hit him with time? No, so the last thing I saw was yesterday that um, he they were in deliberation. But um, I don't know what the uh, outcome of that deliberation was. What was the outcome of the deliberation for, uh, for, 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 for the orange one? St. Vincent. So born in St. Vincent, raised in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and moved to uh, Scotland. There's a story in there. There's a, there's, a, there's a book in there. There's a book in there, for real, for real. Oh, the gentrification is ridiculous. You wouldn't recognize Bed-Stuy, bro. You wouldn't recognize it at all. Like, it's, it's, it's crazy. Brooklyn is especially like Harlem is gentrified. Brooklyn is gentrified like a motherfucker. For real, for real. Um, so they convicted Trump on 34 counts. Four years max for each count. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. You know, his enemies would have killed him if they could. You know, they would have killed him if they could, but they didn't want to make a martyr out of him and set off um, those uh, midget minded minion of his. You know, Trump is, he attracts 
um, for the most part, his core is a uh, a rural, backward, you know, um, ignorant base of non-melanated people, and uh, they don't do a whole lot of critical thinking. So. And they've been under attack by their government for the last 30 years, peace and pulling their, their lives apart piece by piece. And so if they would have killed them, they would have just set them in motion. And they got a lot of guns. So, yeah, what they're gonna do is they're gonna do like they do with our heroes, you know, um, when they don't wanna martyr them, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna bury them. I don't know, Ed. I think I think he might end up with some time. Dorian Moneybags, what's happening, man? We hold something, money bags. We hold something. <laughs> Your mom's still lives in Brooklyn, and 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 you don't go. You haven't been here in twenty five years. You haven't seen your mom in twenty five years, brother. That's outrageous if that's the case. That's outrageous. That's outrageous. I mean, I don't know what the dynamic uh, between you and your mom is, but... Oh, she comes to Scotland. Oh, okay, 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 okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. OG Valley Dread, welcome back, man. What's happening, OG Valley Dread 609? Where's, where's that boy Ty Mills? Where you at, Ty Mills? He may not, he may, he may get a month for each count, but they can work the system too. It'll be interesting. I mean, yeah, he still has other cases. With all the cases that he has, the possibility of him um, not getting any time is kind of crazy. You know what I mean? Because he's got a lot of fucking cases. He's got a lot of charges. You know? So, it, it, it'll be very difficult to, uh, you know, for him not to actually get any time. No time at all. You know what I'm saying? Ron's Graphics, welcome. Yo, Tom Mills, where you at, man? Where you at, Tom Mills? I think that Tom Mills right there. <laughs> A little unexpected treat for you guys today. Pop and son in the building together. Let's see, we'll do something. Do something real, real cool. You understand me? Get this setup going. Got a brother, um, D2B Trappy 96. He he was born in um, St. Vincent in the Caribbean, yeah. and he um, he grew up in Bed Stuy, Brooklyn, and he'd been in Scotland with his lady since '99, his wife since '99. Where you want to sit? Huh? Where you want to sit? Um, what do you think? What do you think is best? Um, okay, let's use the bosses. Yeah, man. Um, you know they they uh they they got uh they found dude guilty. They found Orange Man guilty. Thirty four was he said? Thirty four counts. They convicted him on thirty four counts, and the max on each one is four years for each count. That's a. Uh, it's a lot of motherfucking time. What's that? Uh, 68, uh, 100, 172. <laughs> he can do it. You know, nobody can do time like me. I'm the best time doer that ever did time. 
If I do time, everybody will want to do it. Everybody would want to do time like I do time, you know. Everybody would want to imitate my time doing, you know. I bet he won't be grabbing no pussies in the motherfucking federal penitentiary. I bet you that much. He gonna grab, he gonna grab some bussy, <laughs> some badussy. <laughs> you dig? You gonna grab some badussy orange, man. It's the orange man, ladies and gentlemen. Will this widen enough to grab my phone, you think? Um, I don't think so. Your phone is like mini Yeah, uh, maybe if I fold it in half. Oh. Oh, you uh, won't be able to see, but it'll still be good, though. Yeah? Yeah. It's not going to mess up with you. And, um, all right, y'all, I'm going to convert this thing. Here we go. Here we go. There it is. Now, is that, maybe we should do it this way? No, nah, this is the other way. We can just back up. Oh, you sure? Then they gotta turn their phones. This oh, okay. Okay, they gotta turn their phone. Did we do that? <laughs> yeah. Old oh, niggas don't know how to use technology. You did? I still like revolvers. <laughs> like the like that motherfucking judge. Hey man. <laughs> One thing your grandmother taught me. They got a wet ass phone. <laughs> got the wet, got the wop, wet ass phone. Can't read what they saying though. Boom. I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure that out. Hold on to your dreams. It's not as bad as it seems. Hold on to tomorrow. Keep looking up to heaven above. There is a way. We back. We live. We lit. It, it's crazy. We looking at it down here. That shit is like delayed response and shit. We live. It's crazy. We looking at it down here. That shit is like delayed response. <laughs> That's gonna bug me the fuck out right there. I know, son. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so we get to see what they saying here. Yeah. Okay. Peace. What's going on, hip hop vegan? That's another Brooklynite right there. DTB uh, Trappy. That's another Brooklynite right there. Right there. We say we old but it's a privilege to be old youngin yeah how about that tell that motherfucker you motherfucking right boy especially when you got the years but you got the youth too you know that shit is especially appreciable bro you know what i mean because i have the wisdom of years but i have the physicality of youth you know don't nothing hurt on me when when i get up and move it it no uh, uh, it, uh, ain't none of that. I hop up out the bed like like a little kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, can you you can't sit down? Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Let's see what happens. In the frame, in the frame. Okay, that's crazy. All right, so um. I just happened to, I had come into town today because uh, uh, a friend of my wife's and her brother, his mom was being buried today. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And so, um, and he's buried, she, they buried her, she's Muslim, and they buried her in the same um, place that Mo's uncle, remember she was out of taking care of him? Mm -hmm. uh, same place. So, here, like, the homie's mom's spot is like 20 feet that way. So we went to check his site. I don't really believe in 
going to visit holes in the ground. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. It's like the person is no longer in the physical uh, carrier anymore. You know, it's like, it's like washing your car after it's been crushed and compacted into a cube of scrap metal. You know what I mean? It's, that doesn't, it, it doesn't have, there's nothing there anymore. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like buying a bag of empty potato chips. You, you feel me? Not to, you know, trivialize the, you know, but it is that. It's like, there's nothing there. It's a, it's a, it's a Eurocentric process. It's a Eurocentric practice. Mental. Yeah, it's like, I, I, I commune with my ancestors through my recall, through my memory, and through my genetics. Not, you know, some morbid practice. I don't even believe in the whole burying process. I don't believe in that. Like, I don't subscribe to that. You know what I'm saying? Like, what are you doing that for? It's a business. It's a fucking it's a, it's business. It's a business. It's, it's a, a business. business. And it's one of the most lucrative businesses out there. Like, you own a funeral home, boy, you, you always going to have business. You like, it's, right. it's definitely a wealth building. So, you know, in the business, they try to figure out how to get the most out of you. Like, because they understand you're in a vulnerable state, a lot of people, like most, I ain't gonna say that, fuck. Um, people have life insurance <laughs> and they try to get the max out of the policy. So yes, it's like, I seen a guy say that. You got 100,000, we wanna get the whole 100,000. It's like, you know, you, you want your mother to go out the best. You know, she deserved the silk inside the casket. She know the real gold on the outside. Like, and they just really trying to get the maximum money out of you. So I see the guy win. say that. They can win. Like, I so seen the guy say that from my own. You know, it's, it's, it's just a play on your vulnerability, just the whole business. So That's some cold like, shit. Is, I mean, is that worse than, is that worse than a drug dealer? I mean, yeah, because you know why I say that? Because the drug dealer, you going to get your drug, like you're not in a vulnerable state. You just going to get whatever your drug of choice is or whatever your fix is. But this person is recognizing that you're vulnerable, you're emotional, and you're not in the most rational or logical state. So you, you're doing things pure, purely off of emotion. Right. And they're poking at, poking at those, those points. And it doesn't help you overall mentally. It just makes this more hard for you in this space. Like losing your mother, burying your mother. Like, boy, that's... I don't think, I don't think that process goes away. Like, I think you can kind of live with that process. Now people be like, yeah, you get over it. I'm like, no, I didn't get over it. It's like, I, I just live with this. This happened. And well, yeah, I mean, when I lost your grandmother, that, that really is what changed everything. Absolutely changed everything, bro. Through your grandmother, I believed that I was capable of anything and everything, right? Uh, your grandmother made me um, formidable. She made me indestructible, not just through the things that she taught me, but also through uh, her backing of me, her reinforcement of me. She was always on my side, no matter what. Like, if you called my mother, like, you know, I, I, I was a spoiled kid and I, behaved, I misbehaved. So in school, you know, I misbehaved, whatever they call my mother. My mother come in, she come in to sit down, she be like, like what, motherfucker? What you call me for? And they be like, well, Cavario's being disruptive, whatever, whatever. I know what the fuck he do. What, what, what you want? He's a kid, what you want? Well, we would, you know, we think that he should, you, you don't think you, you don't tell him what the fuck to do with mine. <laughs> that's, that's how she was. I said, when the police, when the, uh, when the teachers would tell me they go call my mother, I'd be like, yeah, I don't think you should do that. <laughs> because when she comes, she gonna be like, fuck, what's up? That's my nigga right there, what's, what's up? You know what I mean? Like, and, and when you have that kind of support and that kind of encouragement and then that kind of training, you know, um, you, you move different, you feel different. 
and the world is different to you. I saw the world through that filter that she created. Like nothing can stop you, nothing can beat you. You know what I mean? Um, I'm the only thing that, that you have to worry about. And then at a certain point, I didn't, I wasn't worried about her. You know what I mean? And, and I was uh, fucking, you know, indomitable. You know what I mean? I was fucking unbeatable. And then when she passed, it was like I, something I didn't know was there was taken. And all of a sudden, I just felt like first, we had just got the house in Virginia Beach. You remember? And um, we had been there maybe three months. And as soon as I got back, the first thing I did was like get life insurance. I had never had life insurance. First thing I did was get I life insurance. That. I remember when we got life insurance. Yeah, first thing I did. That was because, a long ass day. Yes, because, you know, uh, I, had, I had to pay for a funeral. Um, she had a life insurance policy, but the name on the life insurance policy was uh, some man's name that nobody in my family knew who she was. Nobody, nobody, I, didn't, I called ex-boyfriends, nobody. Nobody knew who, she was, knew who this guy was. So I was like, you know, for one, once I saw how expensive it was to bury someone, then I was like, oh no, I, I definitely can't burden mine with that, and I'm in the street. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I can't act as though, just like I had money for lawyers, and bills, I've got to have money for if something happens to me. And when I was going through that thing, that process of trying to find her life insurance policy and going through all her shit and all of that, I was like, uh, yeah, let me let me get this life insurance policy, you know? So um, after that like response, you know, that like that new level of awareness, like, okay, nigga, you gotta have life insurance and you know, man, you you, you gotta you gotta make sure everything is situated and straight just in case something happens, whatever, whatever, just not the other. And and I kinda like settled after her death, you know, you know, because right after her death, um, I jumped into BM and drove back to um Virginia Beach. Actually no. Y'all went back with with uh Tiffany. And um then um, I, I hung up. I hung out for a few days more up top. Um, that was the day y'all left. That sun, that night, I met. Uh, I was introduced to Biggie at the uh, at the tunnel that night because um, I had to send some work out. I had to send some work out to be more. So I stayed back to take care of that business. It didn't hit me immediately, you know, like the whole impact of losing her. It didn't hit me immediately. I was too busy taking care of things and. When I finally settled and all of that, and you know, got back to uh, Virginia Beach, and then, um, you know, just I was sitting in our backyard, you know, that big ass fucking backyard shit, like a diamond, like a baseball diamond. I'm sitting there and shit. I'm looking up at the fucking stars and shit. I'm like, like first of all, you know, here niggas from fucking, you know, from the hood, sitting out here, and, and, and you know, in this beautiful yard and this. You know, it's beautiful community, whatever, long way from where the nigga come from, you know? And and I thought about my fortune and I thought about how I got to this point, and then it hit me what I had lost. And I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed, man. And I didn't know like it was it was difficult to uh care. I didn't like all the things that were important to me they suddenly weren't important to me. You know, it wasn't important anymore. Like, all of a sudden, I really didn't care about anything. You know, and I'd been driven by going and getting it and taking care and doing and all that. All of a sudden, it was like it was all gone. And I just, I just was like, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck, I don't give a fuck. If I live, die, I don't give a fuck, you know? And um, that kind of, you know, kind of lingered on me. And then um, Tiffany gave me that book, Monster, Monster first. She gave me Monster. And when I read Monster, um, no, 
bef no, before that, I just kind of like started to withdraw. And I, I'm trying to think because before, before we went to Atlanta, see, mommy died in 94. We bought the house in Atlanta in 96 before the Olympics. So we stayed in Virginia Beach, left that house. Oh, I don't remember. The feds grabbed BC. So as I'm reeling with this, dealing with this whole death of my mother shit, the last uh, pillar of my developmental world was my uncle Butch Cassidy. And you know, this is the family boss. And he gets popped in 95. So months, months later, he gets popped. And when he gets popped, you know, I'm still, I'm still holding it together, but I'm, I'm, I'm going through something I'm not realizing I'm going through, you know what I mean? I'm going through, like I, I, I buried a lot of people, you know what I mean? So I'm thinking this is just another death. I'm just dealing with another death. I'm not thinking this is some devastating, life altering, motherfucking, mind bending shit that I'm dealing with at all. I never talked to anybody who ever said, yo, losing your mother is different. And nobody ever said that to me. So when I lose BC, it was like, now I'm, you know, I'm dealing with this death, but I'm also dealing with this major event in my life. Because when the feds grabbed him, of course, they're looking for everybody, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm home uh, in Virginia Beach. I had went to uh, Picasso's. Um, I brought Lance down. So we hanging out at Picasso's all night. We stopped at uh, a gas station. It's about six in the morning. We about to head home. I stopped at the gas station to get some gas for those. And I get a text. And it's uh, BC's son, Mark. But I don't know that. It's his, no, it's not a text, a beat, you know, page. Yeah. And I see uh, BC's code, 777, and I see 911. And we have a, a rule. Don't put 911 in the, in, the, in the pager, you know what I mean? Like, just don't, no matter what happens, you don't put 911 in the pager. So at the same time, during this time, he had a thing going on with these young dudes from Harlem, these young kids who was running around pushing up on a lot of older niggas. And I guess they thought he was one of them type of older niggas. You had niggas in the street that was like street level bosses, you know? So they had names in the street. But the real bosses, unless you were somebody, you didn't even know their fucking name. Unless you've been around, they, BC was one of them guys. And they thought that BC was one of them local, you know, bosses, one of them local guys who, you know, you see riding around, whatever, whatever. No, this motherfucker was buying whole city blocks. This, this, this ain't, this ain't that. Like this nigga's buying whole city blocks. This nigga's, you know, spending, you know, millions of fucking dollars on real estate. Like this is another level of motherfucker. This ain't nobody to be playing with. This ain't nobody for some some nigga. These niggas, these a bunch of little niggas. They have these niggas didn't have no car. <laughs> they didn't even had no fucking cars. Like they were inclined to run out of motherfucking bullets. Like for real. Like they didn't have no bread. And you fucking with this nigga? He was playing with them like a ball of yarn, like a cat plays with a ball of yarn. So this was going on, right? He out there banging out with them just just for fun for him. They out there banging out in front of PJ's own kind of shit on 7th Avenue and all that, right? So when I see his code and I see 911, I'm like, that don't make no sense. He would never do that. So I take out my, my burner and I call a number and it's Mark. And he says, yo, they got him. So I'm thinking, who? The little niggas got him? And he was like, nah, the people got him. I was like, yo, get the fuck out of here, bro. Get out of here. He's like, yeah. So when he said that, when he said them people got him, it felt like, you know how you see a, you know how you watch the water go down like this? Mm -hmm. And like you could see that suction. 
It felt like I was being sucked into a vortex. That's how I felt. Yeah. It felt like all my life, right? I had known that it could end this way. And that it, and it tends in this way, even though nobody in our family had went to jail for drugs. Uh, guns, violence, but never drugs. So in my mind, when you took care of business the way it was supposed to be taken care of, you didn't go to jail. You know, when you behave responsibly and disciplined, you didn't go to jail, not for no drugs. So although I, I, I knew that people did lock the fuck up for this, I also knew I moved in a way that made it as least likely as possible that I would. But I always knew that he had to be mentally prepared for the potential. When he said those people got him, I was like, this is something like you always knew could happen, but the moment it happens, you feel completely fucking different, bro. You feel completely different. You feel like this, these are thoughts that went to my mind. My life is over. Life as I know it is over. Now, it was never my intention to be captured. It was like, like, I'm out of here. But I know what that means. It means I have to leave everything. I can't run with little kids. I can't run with no, no girl. I got, I got to go. So I got on the highway, right? Me and Lance. I didn't even go home. I didn't even go home. I didn't even go by my house because I don't know. Even though I know when we moved to Virginia Beach, nobody had any idea we were moving. No one. No one. Yeah, I, I didn't. We, no I, one. We thought we were going back to the house in Jersey. Yep. And we just yeah, kept you was at, you, was at your, we, you, you was at your mom's house yeah. in the summertime. So summertime. you went to go spend the summer with your mother. Your brothers went to go spend the summer with their mother. Mm -hmm. So... Got the house, never told anybody. I had Lon and Jay help me move at we hung out at PJ's all night long. And I was like, yo, call me out to the crib, out to Jerz. When he got out there, I had a big giant motherfucking moving truck out there. <laughs> like the 18 wheeler shit. I said, yo, come on me upstairs real quick. I said, yeah, take that. Uh, take that right there, take it, grab that, help me get this, uh, grab that, whatever. It's like, what you doing? I was like, yeah, out of here, nigga. Nobody had any idea. Now, first of all, nobody knew we lived in Jersey. But they knew we lived in Jersey somewhere. When, when we went to Virginia Beach, nobody had any idea that we moved from wherever the hell it was we lived. I mean, you know, your mother didn't know where we lived. Your brother's mothers didn't know where we lived. Nobody knew where we lived. Nobody came to our house. Nobody. So when, um, when we left and we got, you know, we got down there, whatever, they were like, I felt like, I am, I'm off the grid, like I'm off the radar, you know what I mean? Like they cannot find me, they cannot find me. If anybody's looking for me, they couldn't find me. Now this, when we went down there, nobody was looking for me, right? But I was like, they cannot find me. So I can sleep in peace here, really sleep in peace here because nobody has any idea where we are. And nobody's gonna happen upon us. Living on Prospect Avenue in Hackensack, New Jersey, motherfucker might happen upon you, might happen to ride by, you need 25 minutes from the city. You might happen to ride by and see a nigga, you know, coming out the building or coming out the garage or whatever that, you know? So when that text came through and that call happened, I was like, damn, there's a possibility. You know, I was taught never to underestimate them. So I said, it's a possibility. They may know where I live. It's a possibility. I didn't have any phone that you could, you know, this is during the analog days. Tracking a phone like that, these are burner phones. I changed my number like literally like every 72, every 96 hours. I had a new phone number. We used to get our phones and they had this little box we put on the bottom of them. And we put the box on the bottom of them and we had a list. And every 96 hours we could change our number. Puerto Rico, Santa Domingo, uh, you know, whatever. We change our number like every 96 hours. I'll call you from one number, hang up, five minutes later, call you back, same phone, different number. Right? And we get on the highway. We get on the highway, right? Me and Lance get on the highway. I gas up. And we get on the highway. And 
it was like, it was like I was in a dream. I felt like I was in a dream, you know? I was just like, you, you, you know how Spike Lee movies, they do that effect where the, the, on the rolling cart, <laughs> you just move. And the world is just like, and you just like move along. Like, that's how I felt, bro. It's the worst fucking feeling in the world, bro. It is the worst feeling in the world. And it's like having the whole, you know, you've ever had a chair pulled out from underneath you. It's like having the whole world pulled out from underneath you. And I'm on the highway. And you remember how I had the Bronco hooked up for speed and performance all that? Bro, I, I, I went to go see my crew in, in Virginia to pick up some bread. And um, I didn't go over 55 miles an hour. Not once, not 56, not 55 and a half. No, I want no reason whatsoever to be stopped and come to come to police. But at the same time, I'm driving, but I don't really know where I'm driving to because I don't know where I'm safe. Now, Tiffany is at the house waiting for me to come home. She had to go to work that day, right? So she worked on the beach at a, a headhunting um, uh, 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 office, you know, where they hire executives. Headhunters are people who um, call companies to try and get people who work for companies to take a job at another company. You know, it's like, yo, I know you're getting, you know, whatever you're getting there, but I got a company that's interested in hiring you. This is before LinkedIn and all that type of shit. It's way before, this. you're talking about 95. So, you know, she worked for a company like that. And um, we get on the highway and we, we drive and I waited for her to go to work. I, I didn't want to call her. Um, her her phone. I didn't want to call our phone, so I, uh, I we get on the highway. We start heading towards Virginia. I'm I'm heading towards uh, uh, Char Charlottesville. That's where the, uh, my crew was. Um, I was rocking in Charlottesville and Richmond, and uh, I started rocking in Richmond because Charlottesville is so small that um, that's where the University of Virginia is. Uh, Charlottesville is so small that you don't really want to be there. If you don't belong there, you don't, you don't want to be there because you'll stand out. Like everybody will know that you are some out of town in town with some work. So I would hit them and then I would go to Richmond and I would be rocking in the projects in Richmond because Richmond's a city. So I'm on the highway heading to Charlottesville and I, um, I get to Charlottesville and you know I wake my crew up or whatever, whatever. I don't tell them nothing of course. You know I just collect the bread and all that whatever whatever. But I'm trying to act normal, but my whole insides are just like upside down. And then I'm, I'm talking like this, and I'm, you know, what's up, uh, yo, y'all good? It's okay. It's like, Cause it's like, all of this seems like for nothing, nigga, it's over. It's over, right? And I, uh, I call her, I get the bread from them. I hang up with them for a couple of hours. It's early morning now. I call her when she gets to work. I wait till like nine o'clock, nine thirty. Call her, and I say, "Hey, um, anybody come to the house looking for me?" She goes, "No. Where you at?" I said, oh, "I had to get on the road real quick. But nobody came to the house." I said, "No." I said, "Okay. Um, when you get lunch, go over to the crib and see if you see anything." I lived in a cul-de-sac. See if you see anything. And um, I'm telling you, I lived in cul-de-sac. <laughs> you lived in cul-de-sac. Uh, we lived in a, a place called Ocean Lakes. Ocean Lakes. Ocean Lakes. And um, so we are, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking to her and I tell her, you know, look and see if you see like a note on the door or a card or something like that or whatever. And then, you know, I tell you know, hit me, you know, hit me back when you, when you uh, check that. But don't call me. Don't call me from the house. Call me, you know, uh, from your job. Like, come back to your job and call me. So she, um, you know, she said, okay. She don't have no idea what's going on. I ain't told her yet. They got my uncle or nothing. So we get on the highway and we head to Baltimore. So, you know, I'm going to Baltimore to pick up more bread or whatever. But I don't go into the city. I don't go nowhere near none of my blocks. I'm all the way out in like, what part of fucking Baltimore is that? Like way out in the outskirts. Maybe Owens Mills or some shit like that. And I called my lieutenant, who was my, my first cousin. 
the one who I dedicated my, my book to, Reno. So I call him and I say, uh, hey, um, they got they got dude. Um, make your rounds, come and meet me out here. Might have been Dundalk, I think it was Dundalk. I said, make your rounds, come out here and meet me, you know, bring me the bag. So, you know, he did that, bring me the bag, whatever. And um, I get on the highway. Now I'm heading up to New York. And, you know, my thing is to meet with his wife and um, give her the bag and, you know, and say my goodbyes. Cause I was like, like I told her when I, you know, so we get on the road, we head back, we head down. Now I'm still, I'm driving like granny, bro. I'm driving like granny because I don't know where I'm going. Like, I don't know where I'm going in life now. I don't know that I'm still dealing with my mother's death. I have no idea. Like, I really don't. I have no idea. This is maybe, your grandmother died in September. So, I told her November. I said, no, I told her November. December, January, February, March, April. So it was, it was about six months seven months later, 95. New York is hot as a firecracker, super hot. They are locking it in, locked up, like almost every fucking crew. They locked up preacher in them, um, you know, uh, they locked up, uh, like every fucking body, they locked up everybody, right? So when we get, when I get there, I go to Valerie's. I go to, uh, um, yeah, right? So I go to, this is Tiffany's aunt and, and Tina. So I go to her house. She had a little Suzuki Jeep. I drop my truck off. I get a Suzuki Jeep and I put on this big ass Rasta hat. And I pull it way down, right? And we go into the city and shit. <laughs> and um, we get up there and I, you know, I, I call her, I call, you know, I call, BC's wife and we meet and she's like, yeah, you know, they grabbed him. Um, and um, I don't, she didn't know what had happened at the time, like completely. Um, I found out from him when I set up a call um, for, you know, a time and place for him to call me um, some, a couple of months later. And he told me what had happened was he had, he was sitting, he was sitting in PJs and he had sent his old bodyguard been with him forever, old crazy motherfucker named Herc, peaceful journey Herc. Herc was a monster. Um, Herc had went out to the car. Herc didn't have a driver's license. Herc went out to the car to move the car. It was double parked in front of PJs. It's on 32nd and 7th Avenue. That's when PJs was on the corner of 132nd and 7th Avenue on the, down, on the downtown side. So he went to move the car and he did a U-turn. And when he did the U-turn, police hit him, whoop, whoop. So BC go out there and like, hey, well, yo, that's my car, whatever, whatever. Because he went out there because um, he had a, uh, he had an AK-47 in the car, right? And, you know, he didn't want them to search him or whatever, whatever, and he had no driver's license. So he's like, yeah, that's mine, you know, it's my car, whatever, but which, you know, I'm just having a move, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, okay, well, um, can, can you, um, we just gotta give him a, give, give, give you a ticket or whatever. Can you, can you um, come to the precinct? Can you follow us to the precinct? Now the precinct is 135th Street. The precinct is three blocks away. So he's like, all right, you know, okay, cool. So they, uh, he parked, he parks the car and then um, they, you know, take the, they, they, they Take a somebody takes him in their car over to what you call it, to the precinct. He goes inside the precinct and he's sitting there. And as soon as he gets in there, two white dudes, two white guys walk up in suits and then they say, Oh, you know, uh, they call him by his name, his government name, and they go, Um, you know, we're with the FBI, agent so and so, agent so and so, special agent so and so, special agent so and so, and um, you know. Um, we've been, you know, there's been a warrant issued for your arrest, whatever, whatever. Now, unbeknownst to us, he knew that they were coming. He'd known for a year because the kid, uh, Fat Leon, 
who I talked about with uh, with Lou on that interview that I did with Lou on um, Vlad TV. We talked about his friend Leon, Fat Leon. Fat Leon, when Fat Leon got popped, he told everybody, include my uncle. But he had never dealt with my uncle. He dealt with my cousin. And, but you know, everybody knew that my cousin was up under my uncle, but he had never dealt with him. But when he got popped, he knew this is a big fish. They've been after this guy for 30 years. Like the federal agent, when the federal agent like was talking to him, he was like, you know, sir, um, when I came on to, you know, to the, uh, to the federal force uh, 20 years ago, you were already a legend. You were already a legend. When I got it, like, it's an honor to meet you, you know? They knew that this man had several college degrees and, you know, had run an empire that expanded across the fucking country, you know, um, and, you know, had multiple fucking businesses for decades and shit like that. Just a week before this happened, he had just um, gotten a city, a square city block in Queens, and he got it for 700000 because no one else showed up to the auction. You know, so they knew who he was, you know, and they, and they had a lot of regard and respect for him. So when Leon got popped, Leon was like, yo, y'all want this guy for sure, you want this guy. And Leon told them that BC told him to um, to do something to those kids that was running around. Them kids had they had ran up a uh, peaceful journey to Daddy uh, um, and on uh, Jesus. Um, they had ran down on Jesus, robbed them, took a Rolex from him, whatever. They were. Jesus was a respected dude in the street, you know what I mean? But Jesus was not a Butch Cassidy, you know what I'm saying? And um, you know, and, and I heard they had ran up on other cats, you know, young niggas, young dirty niggas. You know what I mean? They call themselves the Young Guns or some shit like that. So, baby gangsters, Young Guns. Yes. <laughs> I was just talking about the BGYGs. So these these motherfuckers, they had no idea what they was fucking with, bro. Oh, and and when I went to see him, when I found out about the, the, what was going on, he was like, "Yo, you gotta come up here, man. Your uncle's wilding out, man. He out there, out here shooting and shit." I said, "We doing what? He's shooting and shit. We got a multi-million dollar fucking operation going on. You standing outside." Having shootouts with little kids? Like, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, yo, I ain't did nothing in so long. I had to show these motherfuckers, whatever. I said, nigga, it's time for you to retire. I swear to God, I said, it's time for you to retire. You're bored. It's time for you to fucking retire. Like, for real. You bugging out. You know what I mean? There was a time you did, you heard about him, but you didn't see him. He was like fucking Kaiser Soze. In real life. You heard about him, but you did not see him. And then... In the early 90s, he started like coming out a lot. You know? This is a guy who ran miles every day. He's in the martial arts heavy. Didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't do nothing. Now you're hanging out all night, you're smoking cigarettes all night, you're drinking all motherfucking night. You know what I mean? Sliding on niggas and shit. Like, you having a fucking midlife crisis. You are too important and too powerful to have a midlife crisis. This is what I'm telling him. You know, so he's like, ah, hey, I'll play with them. And when I get, when I'm done playing with them, you know, he's he's using them to, you know, if you read Raised by Wolves and you know that I played a lot of chess, you know what I'm saying? Like I've said before, it's good to be tough, but it's better to be smart. You know what I mean? Um, and I learned that from him and my mother. You know, and so he he was using the opportunity because these guys had made somewhat of a name for themselves in in that time and space which really didn't mean anything but it meant something to to regular people because they didn't have another point of reference so because they had set themselves up as being something to you know regard or revere or whatever for him to just go bink and knock them off would just reinforce and refresh his reputation. So that's what he was using him as. 
right? So, you know, the feds uh, save what was left of them by grabbing him. And they grabbed him because Leon told them that, because Leon tapped him. He said that BC said tap him. BC never talked to him. He never talked to BC. You, you don't know this man. That's why Leon ended up, if, if you, again, if you watch the interview that I did with Lou Sims on Vlad TV, you, 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 you learned that Leon told all these people, but Leon still ended up having his deal torn up. So he ended up telling and ended up still doing life as a rat. His ratting didn't help him because they found out that he lied. And that's what they'll do to you if they find out you lie. If they find out you told one fucking lie, hold one fucking crime back, they'll use all the information and, and disregard the deal they made with you. And he lied. He didn't know BC. And he didn't know my cousin's real name. And he couldn't find my cousin. He couldn't, like, put them on him because my cousin, at the time, unbeknownst to no one, unbeknownst to everybody, was sitting in the Bronx house, which is now that mall over there on 149th like to like 151st over there mm. underneath the Deegan. Yeah. That was the Bronx house, right? Yeah, that was the Bronx house. So he was in the Bronx house for a pistol. He had went shopping one day in Manhattan and because of this thing that was going on with these guys, he had to keep the thing on him all the time. Because he had gotten to a bang out with them in the middle of the fucking afternoon one day on 7th Avenue. And um, saved the homie um, Tony Kidd's life. They hit Tony Kidd in the ankle. And he backed their motherfucking asses down. Bom, 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 bom. Bom, yo, laid their motherfucking asses low. They was like, yo. And, and people didn't know that he was like this. They thought he was, because he was very soft spoken and all that, whatever, whatever. But you really couldn't be. Uh, us and not be about it. It just, you couldn't, right? All that, you know, slathering at the mouth and, you know, dragging the knuckle shit. Be just as cool and just as calm and just as cold blooded as a motherfucker, boy, boy. He did. So, um, he had to keep the thing on. So, he had the thing on. So, this is back when they had the brownies. The brownies was the motherfuckers to run around giving people tickets. That's all they did. They were like ticket police, traffic police. But they wore brown uniforms. They be in them little cart things. Yes. Niggas would run and push them shits over yeah. with them motherfuckers in it. And so he got into a thing. He was parked down on 57th Street. Got into a thing with one of the brownies about giving him a ticket. And he beat the brownie up. And he got arrested. And he had a bunch of shopping bags. And he had the joint in the bag. Mm -hmm. So the cops were like, eh, hey, so whatever. We'll take you down here. Process you, whatever, down to you, you be out. Okay, cool. They checked them all out, whatever, no problem. So they get inside the motherfucking joint and they take his bags again. They say, oh, you shopping? Oh, this is nice. Oh, oh, what the fuck? Who checked this fucking guy? And so he ended up, we did a, um, like a party for him at PJ. It's a going away party. And we was up and drinking all night till like 11 o'clock in the fucking morning. Well, we used to go hard, my nigga. Hard, you dig? Like, hard, you know? And, but nobody knew, though. Nobody knew that he was going to jail, except us. So, when Leon started telling, he couldn't connect that dot directly from him to BC because he didn't know BC. He only knew Nunu. And he didn't know Nunu's real name. So, he couldn't tell them the name so that they could find him and find that he was in the Bronx house during eight months for the pistol. So Nunu not being there was kind of a, it was a pivotal connection because the question was, okay, you know him, he said that, how, how, how he look? What, what he sound like? When did he say it? What did he say? Like, nigga, it never happened. You never talked to this man. So his lawyer had told him, yo, they coming. I don't know when, but they coming. And it took a year for them to come around because they knew they were dealing with somebody who had resources. Mm 
legitimate, this man was a legitimate millionaire. He wasn't just a drug millionaire, he was a legitimate millionaire from his businesses, legitimate businesses. So they knew they couldn't just come at him because they were gonna have an expensive fight. So they waited and they waited until they felt they had a strong enough case and then they came at him. Um, and that was the day that they did that whole, you know, oh, come to the precinct, whatever. The, the feds sent them to go and get him um, with under the auspices of the traffic thing because they knew that he was surrounded by a bunch of armed motherfuckers and they didn't want to get into a shootout with, with, with these niggas, right? So they were like, you know, yeah, just take him to the precinct, whatever, whatever, and then we'll come in there and effect the arrest. So that's what happened. And so when I get the call, when I get the page, the 911, and I call, and I'm like, yo, what the fuck? And he's like, they got him. They had gotten him. So I come up, I meet with her, and um, you know, I give her the bag, and she tells me what she knew at the time, which is none of what I just said. She knew none of that. And she's like, um, you know, she's like, what you gonna do? I said, um, you, you're never gonna see me again. I'm, I'm gone. You're never gonna see me again. If you read Raised by Wolves, you'll read a part where I talk about when I was like nine years old, I had a plan. My plan was to keep a briefcase with $50,000 in it. Now you gotta think now, $50,000 in 1976 was like a quarter of a million dollars now, if not, if not more. So what you could buy with a quarter of a million dollars now, I could buy $50,000 then. I said, I'm always gonna keep a briefcase with 50000 in it and um, a passport. This is nine years old. Nine years old. That was my plan. At nine years old, I was already decided I'm going to be the boss of our family when I grow up and I'm being groomed for it. I'm going to be the boss of our family. And had he not gotten popped, it's almost a blessing. Because had he not gotten popped, then I would have been. I would have been, you know, the boss. If he hadn't gotten popped, he would have backed out and I would have, I'm the only motherfucking one who had the strength of character, intelligence, wherewithal, discipline, you know what I mean? I'm not, there was nobody else amongst us who had that. You know what I mean? Nunu was solid, but Nunu was nowhere near as experienced as I whatsoever. Nunu never, been out and about, you know, and really put work in on the ground and like that. They didn't, they didn't do that. I was the one who took care of everything, you know. I was the one, like, if there was a problem anywhere, you know, wherever it might be, whatever, whatever, situation, conflict, whatever, whatever, wild child was coming. You know, that's what he called me, wild child. The wild child was coming. I'm a sin wild child, you know. And, um, so when she, you know, when I told her that, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm, you never gonna, Probably never gonna see me again. Now, my girl is home waiting for me to come home. Um, you know, he's there. His brothers are in North Carolina. And, you know, so she, I, I like, I'm in New York for like maybe three days. I was with your Uncle Trevor. At the time, he was working in the movie theater. This is my best friend, it's the white kid that y'all read about my book and all that, right? On the Upper West Side. So uh, I'm with him and I call home from a pay phone. And um, I call at work. And I'm not calling my house. I call at work and I say, um, you know, I tell her what happened. I say, they got BC. And she's like, oh, so what are you gonna do? When, you, when are you coming home? And I said, probably never. You're probably never gonna see me again. Now think about that now. This is a girl I've been with by this time, um, uh, three years, you know? And, you know, this is like, this is my girl. Like I got other girls, but this is the woman in my home, you know, taking care of my kids. And her life is wrapped around my life, you know? And, you know, she goes to sleep one night and it's all good and blah, blah, blah. And the next morning it's like, yeah, never gonna see you again. Take care of yourself. Like, later on in the process of me evolving at the 
in the aftermath of losing my mother and losing my uncle, later on I thought about, and this has contributed to me making the decision to get out the street. I was like, you don't love somebody and then make the kinds of choices that subject them to that kind of a scenario. This is something that most people in the street never get to. Not until it's too late. Not until they're sitting in a cell or they're lying on the ground with their life's fluid draining from them, knowing that they won't be standing up again. And then they think about not, you know, whether the niggas and the bitches, you know, gonna remember all the cars I had and, and the money I made, but they're thinking about how is this gonna impact their woman, their child, their mother. That's what they're thinking about. When, when they're up and on their feet and doing what they do, they're not thinking about those things. And that's what you should be thinking about. But the game is an ego feeding thing. And ego is the antidote to intelligence, no matter how smart you are. Ego will make you do some stupid shit because it'll tell you, you're you, you can do that. Um, at the point at which I said that to her, you'll probably never see me again. I felt like shit. I was like, what the f This is some bullshit I've gotten this girl into. Like, this is some real bullshit. So now the feds, had never been, they never came to my house because they had no idea where I lived. Um, but of course now it's like, you know, everything has to shift, everything has to change. You know, um, I'm telling her, you know, get him to his mother's house. Get him to his mother. I'm not gonna, you know, make you take care of my son while I, I do I don't know fucking what. And you know what I mean, and you are, at that point, if I was uh, 25, uh, she had to be like 22, maybe, something like that. Or 21, maybe 21. I'm like four years older than her. So, I, so she's like 21. And I met her, she was like 19, 20, 21, 19, 20, 21. So yeah, she was like about to be 22, something like that. And you know, she's from fucking Teaneck, New Jersey. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this is way outside of her wheelhouse. And um, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. You know, I have no idea what I'm gonna do. I can't communicate with my uncle. You know, he and my mother were my counsel. She's gone, he's gone. I don't really trust anybody else. So I'm like, I, I, I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do, but I know what I'm not gonna do. And that's sit in nobody's motherfucking jail cell. I don't give a fuck if I gotta go to Nova Scotia and uh, collect cans. I will not be caged. Uh, you remember in the movie um, with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, um, the one we had a shootout? No, 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 no. They're not in that. The one they had the shootout. The big shootout. The big, the big fucking shootout in the street and the bank robbery and all that. Oh, um, yeah, 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 I know exactly what you're talking what about. What movie is that? Uh, fucking, uh... Who knows what that movie is? Uh, damn, I can't remember the name of that movie. They used the bank scene in a real movie. Yeah. From the... Yeah, when the Mexican cats yeah. did it and they had all the armor and all that. Damn, I watched that shit. Hot. Heat. Heat. The heat. Yeah, heat. Yeah, heat. You remember that part where you said um, that, it, you know, when you spot the heat around the corner, you've got you to gotta go. And there, there can't be anything that you won't leave, you know, behind that you got to, you know, you got to be ready to let it go. And when I, when I saw that in that movie, I was like, that's, that is, that's my credo. Like, I, I may never have articulated it, but it was always, obviously, the little kid, nine years old, said, I'm gonna have a 
has more than fifty thousand in a briefcase. Now I'm just going to keep, you know, and it had always been in my mind that first and foremost I was going to remain free. So you know I wasn't thinking I would have a woman and children and stuff like that. I wasn't thinking that, you know. Um, so when it hit me that that's what it was like, I'm no matter what. I'm going to disappear, you know, uh, and leave everything. It was like, like you start measuring it. You start weighing it. It's like, yeah, I made a lot of money. I was able to do a lot of things that average people weren't able to do. And no matter how many people in the street you know, recognize that as far as the population is concerned, street people represent that much, that much. Street people represent less than 1% of the fucking population. Most people are not in the street, right? So most people don't see tens and hundreds and millions, uh, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars, like, you know, day to day. Most people never see that in their entire lifetime. They'll live, work, and die and never see that in their entire lifetime, you know? Um, so I knew I'd lived an extraordinary life, but at the same time, I thought about what I was giving up and what I had gotten. And when, when I waited, I was giving up way more than what I had gotten. I had gotten a lot, you know? These are the kinds of things that you can't know until you go through it. You can't guess it. You can't measure it because it's, it's something you have to experience on the inside. And most people, when they have this, this kind of a close encounter with the ultimate end, whether it be death or incarceration, they don't get to come out on the other side virtually unscathed, except for psychologically and emotionally you know, and come away with the, with the, with the wisdom of that experience. They usually end up having to pay the, you know, a great fucking price. Oh yeah. You know, um, you know what? I've never asked you, that's amazing. I, I never asked you what it was for you and what you, what was going through your mind during that period. Um, How did it look from your side? I think that was when the first time when I realized I might be depressed like as a kid because it was just like I went from having my brothers there to not having them there. So the whole time that year I spent, I was just by myself. You I sure was. Just, was. I was just home by myself. You sure was. Uh, Tiff was in her room and I was in my room. You was gone and then grandma died and then I seen my brothers and then I went back to New York. And it was just a, it just was a lot going on. And I just knew, I didn't really know what was going on. I just knew grandma died and things just changed. Even like when I went back home and going over to her house and seeing uh, Bootsy and Kelly and everybody over there and then the dynamic shift of power and everything in there was just different. And I was just like, man, that's, it, it was just, you know, it was just definitely a, a major change. It wasn't like I could call you, so I just beep you and put my my code in. So and then, you know, that time period of just not speaking to my brothers at all. Right. You know, um, so so few of us, and this is why I push the education thing so much. This is why I push the reading thing so much. I think a lot of people, let me say this before I say what I'm about to say. I think a lot of people in our community or our collective have this belief that you should only read something with the expressed purpose of learning a particular thing. That's a misconception. It's a bad prospect or bad perspective. You, you should read for the same reason you should work out because your brain is a muscle. It is the ultimate muscle. 
And if you don't exercise it, it will get flabby like any other muscle. And if you don't have, if your brain is flabby, that means that you're, it's not as efficient as it can be. So as you're managing existence and going through life and dealing with things, because your brain is flabby from a lack of use, from a lack of pushing it, when you encounter those especially challenging experiences, you are insufficiently suited to, to deal with them because your shit is flabby, your, your brain is soft, you know? It's not about learning something in particular so you can know that, so you can do the thing that you just learned. It's about sharpening your blade, keeping your blade sharp. Now, I say that to put this into perspective. When I learned, when I began to read, this is after BC got popped and we, uh, you know, uh, Tiff moved out of the house. Cause I told her, I said, look, I I'm not coming back there. You know, you know, you, you can't pay, you can't pay for that house. You know what I mean? Like, just move on with your life. Cause I'm out, you, I, I, you can never see me, I'm out. And she was like, nah, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a figure something out. I'm gonna get, you know what I mean? I had just got it, um, the drop top VM a few months before, you know what I mean? That was a birthday gift. Right, that was 40 some thousand. So it's like 45,000, brand new, you know? And so she, she, she went, first she downgraded the car, went and got a top of the line Honda Accord, remember that, that ice blue joint? Mm -hmm. Went and got a top of the line Honda Accord and then went and, um, Paid a bunch of young dudes, gave them all my Tachini suits, my Tachini sweatsuits, to help her move move the um, stuff out of the out of the apartment. I mean, out of the house um, into a storage, and then went and rented a room, and then went and um, uh, and you know, to find a place, an apartment for us. And uh, and the whole time I'm like, you, yeah, that's cool, short. I appreciate that, all that, whatever, whatever. But you know, I'm I'm not coming back. I was in B more. I said, I'm not, I'm not coming back. Cause I mean, they're fucking looking for me, yeah. right? So now at this point now, um, now I'm just, you know, I'm just rocking with my crew with, with sex money. I'm not fucking around with, you know, my family's situation is completely decimated because of BC situation. Everybody's like, whoever ain't get jammed up is like, you know, Nunu's locked up already, you know, B's locked up, um, you know, Lance was kind of out. He was in trouble again. So, you know, meaning he was like in trouble with the family. He'd get in trouble with the family every so often and he'd have to like run and hide and disappear for a while, whatever, like that. So he wasn't, he wasn't fucking with us for like a couple of years when this happened. Like he had been in the outs. So he'd been doing whatever he was doing, but not fucking with us. So, um, you know, I, 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 so it was just, it was just, you know, just me and Castro and and, and Dula and uh, you know Crazy Johnny and Pete and X and you know just sex money, you know what I mean? And um, and you know BC used to always, he used to always warn me about, you know, he's like yo, you 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 your boys man, you know you you your crew, you, they don't do things the way we do things, you know, because you know it was wild. Right? And, and I didn't even know he knew who they were until one day he told me to come meet him at PJ's. And I was in town, he told me, you know, come meet me at PJ's. I meet him in the afternoon. And um, he's like, so, hey, uh, yeah, so, you know, you look at the newspaper, say, yeah, so um, your, uh, your friends, your boys, they, they don't do things the way we do things, you know? And I'm like, I have no idea who you're talking about. I don't say that, but I say, I got no idea what you're talking about, but he always found things out. He always found things out. Like you couldn't hide shit from this man. And you couldn't hide from him. A nigga ran off on him and went to like, somewhere like, I don't know, Germany or some shit like that. And he found him. Like he was, 
the real fucking deal, bro. The real fucking deal. They, niggas can think what they want to fucking think. But anybody who knows what it really is, I'm talking about his peers, I'm about the actual fucking gangsters, the motherfuckers who came up in the 60s and the 70s and all that, they'll tell you, BC was no motherfucker to be playing with at all. Real life Kaiser Soze. Real fucking life Kaiser Soze. No fucking around. No fucking around whatsoever. You know, so when he said that, I'm like, I'm not saying anything because I don't know what he's talking about. You know, I, I did lie to him. I didn't lie to him on my mother. I didn't lie to him. It was pointless. They could see right through me. So I'm just sitting here waiting for him to kind of let me know what the fuck he's talking about. And he goes, yeah, you know, um, you know, all that, all that mess that they be making, you know, like, you know, the situation over here. The situation over there, I'm like, when he said the situations, I was like, bro, what the fuck? Who told him this shit? Like, I never even told him that these is my niggas. But he always knew what I was doing. Never went to Baltimore, never went to DC, never went like, he never went to Virginia. He, but he always knew what the fuck I was doing. So, you know, I just was like, listening. He's like, yeah, man, like, you know, I don't, I don't want to have to clean up anything. Meaning, um, I don't want to have to uh, try in, in, in an effort to save you, uh, knock all your friends off, you know? And I was like, I was like, I know, they cool. You know, I try to tell them, you know, I, told, I, I try to tell them, I try to talk to them. You know, they have a tendency to do things and then call me after the fact and be like, yo, um, yeah, I just, uh, blah, 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 and now what? I'm like, now you fucked up <laughs> now. You should have called me before you did that. You know what I mean? You know, I, you know, I try to do what I can. That's where the Kabari and the Conceivable Year comes from. Mm -hmm. So, um, he, he ends up with his situation. Um, I'm, you know, now I'm just rocking with, with, with sex money and I don't fuck with nobody. You know, um, I'm in B-Mall, and then, you know, fucking Castro, he fucks around and drops two niggas in front of Jimmy's, and he called me after, and be like, oh, I just dropped two niggas in front of Jimmy's, like, yo, uh, go over there and talk to Jimmy and, and see what he says going on, what they talking about, whatever. And I was like, this is some fucked up shit. So he, he ends up on the run behind that. And he was the one that used to get our, our, um, our girl, you know, and you know, Cooley used to get the boy, right? So now he's on the run. They looking for him. His name is all over the fucking TV. And um, it's a drought, crazy drought. And nobody got nothing. And we ain't got nothing. It's really fucked up. So he's in B-Mall with me. And he gets a call from a nigga. They say, oh, he got he got 20 of them or whatever, whatever in Florida. And not only does he have it, and nobody else does, he has it at like 10,000 less than the last number that we heard when anybody had it, which was like a month. And nobody had it for a month. This nigga got it and it's 10,000. It should be 50 and he's on about 26. Based upon what was going on, by this point, if anybody got it, it's 50. He's, they tell him 26. Me and Cooley, we like, do not go. I don't know what the fuck that's about, but don't go. You on the run. Oh, I got the fake ID, I'm cool with it. Don't go. No, nah, man, I gotta get us some shit. I gotta get us some work. Oh, we got his dope, we got his dope. I said, yo, we like, don't go, man. Like, you, like, listen to me this time. And he's like, okay, okay, I'm not gonna go. Next thing you know, this motherfucker's on the flight to Florida on his fake ID. They go, him and um, another cat, they go and meet with this, this, this other cat and another cat, and they cop the 20. And we had the, um, a lot of people know this about sex when you break these quest vans. And the quest vans had all kinds of stashes and shit in them. And, um, 
we didn't know at the time that uh, one of our main brothers had flipped and been working with the people. And they knew about the Quest fans, and they knew his, they knew his fake ID and all that. We didn't know that, mm. right? They play a slick game with people. So we get down, he gets down to the Florida, you know, make the move, get the joints, put them in the car with Nike and her mom, right? Nike was this, uh, this it's like a white girl. She's like a black white girl. And she used to drive for us. And um, her and her mom was making the drive. And he, instead of him getting on the plane and going back like he was supposed to, he decides he gonna let homie fly back. He gonna ride back with them. He's on the run for two, for two, uh, he dropped like he dropped two dudes, one died, one did two brothers over a fucking beer, a bottle of beer. So he's at Jimmy's and they, um, him and Jimmy are standing there and the guys don't know that the guys whose place this is, you know, is there, right there. And when the, they say something to the bartender, the bartender goes off and they reach behind the bar, grab a beer. So Jimmy, I don't know why, Shout out to my brother Jaime. Jimmy says to John, and then you gonna let him rob us like that? John was crazy. And when John drank, he was insane. Like I used to think he had an alcohol like allergy. Because you drink and he goes fucking nuts. Right? He gets very, very volatile and very dangerous and will do it like that. So John walks over to the guy and says, yo, you gonna pay for the bill, Papa? He goes, the guy said, John told me the guy bit the top off the beard and spat it in John's chest. So John commenced to beat the shit out of him and the guy next to him happened to be the brother. So they dragged the guys outside and I don't know why, but John goes out there behind him and the guy, John looks black, John Spanish. Mm -hmm. And the guy says to the other guy, go to the car in Spanish. He said, go to the car and get the gun. And John said, no man, get that key. I got it right here. I got it right here. Like, you ain't gonna get nothing. I have my gun right here, don't move. He's a corrections officer. It's like, yo, don't move. And the guy goes walk off anyway, he pops them both right there. Ah, right in front of the fucking club, in front of every fucking body. Drops them. One dies, one doesn't. Their mother happens to be somebody who is like politically connected because she works with the liquor board in New York. Mm. And you know they powerful as a motherfucker. Yeah. And what's a restaurant club without his fucking liquor license? Nothing. She goes on the Ricky Lake show. Oh fuck. Talking about this guy, he's a he's a gangster and a killer, and he's a corrections officer. And they put it on him. So this one he got over his head. This motherfucker. He's in that car after they cop these 20 joints. He's in the car with Nike and her mom. And they don't get far, they're on the highway. They get pulled over by a regular cop. And, um, you know, they stop them, talk, whatever, whatever, you know, and then they, you know, search the car and oh, they find it. Those stashes, you ain't gonna find them. You gotta know they're there. Yeah. So they, they you know, they, they, they pop them for the joints. He tells them that these ladies didn't have known that these things was in here. And they let them go. Nike and her mom go. And, uh, they, um, lock him up and he's got this driver's license i forgot what it said i think it was like steve something and so you know of course the call goes around ah, so we all yo yo all right yo what's up with, right, what's up with jake all right yo, look we gotta get cash driver. we gotta get him out we gotta get him out before they find the weeds we gotta get him out before they find the weeds we gotta get him out right so we get the lawyer the lawyer contacts whatever we trying to you know get this nigga out of this bill so they hold him for about two weeks and like oh yo look like they're about to let him go like they're about to you know give him a bill let him go 
You know, they still don't know who he is. And I'm like, they had him for two weeks. He's a corrections officer. His motherfucking, his fingerprints and everything are on record with corrections. And there's an active fucking homicide warrant on him. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But, he, you know, I talked to him. And he's like, they don't, they still don't know why. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, well, something's not right here. And just when they had us thinking we were about to let him go, here come the feds. Mm. And they walk in and they go, uh, so John, <laughs> start talking to him and call him by his name. It's like, oh shit, these motherfuckers, and they knew the whole time. I don't know, they were doing whatever they were doing in the background, but they knew the whole time. So that was like really like the implosion, you know, like of, you know, a significant component of sex money. Of course, you know, we kept on, we kept on rocking. I ended up shifting from Baltimore to North Carolina, Winston, Charlotte, High Point, Greensboro, Raleigh, Durham, you know what I'm saying? Like that there, focusing on the thing, on the dope more so than the coke and all of that. Um, and, um, you know, then, you know, at this point, I'm reading like a motherfucker because Tiffany's giving me these books, the first one of which was, you know, Monster. And that's when I was like, man, this guy could write about his life. I could write about my life. I was thinking about writing a book, but I'm just saying like the idea was like, you, you can you can write about an existence like this. And in the world I come from, you couldn't. And then she gave me, you know, women who love too much. And that led me to be, to becoming monogamous. And then she gave me spirit of a man. And that led to me retiring. Now, by this time, you know, I got your, you and your, your, your brother's back. And uh, then we, we, we leave. We, I get the house out in Marietta. We move to Marietta. You know what I mean? And, you know, we're there. You know? And, um, and then one day I come home and I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I'm finished. And, you know, that was that. Was that. But it was, it was the catalyst for all of those things. For all those changes, it was not, you know, the craziness with sex money or the craziness with, with you know, with the BC mob, not none of that, not none of that. It was my, my mother's death. My mother's death made me go into myself and think about my life in a way I'd never thought about it before. Because, you know, when she was alive, she was my sword and my shield, you know? And through her, I believed I can do any fucking thing. And I thought I could live my life to the degree I was living my life forever. You know, you can't, you can't live that life forever. That shit will eat your ass up. And before you know that your ass is eaten off, it, it'll be gone, you know what I mean? And you'll be a shell of yourself. That shit takes so much I don't think I would be in the physical or mental condition that I'm in today if I had gone farther than 30 years old in that life. I think, excuse me, by, by age 30, by 32, 33, I would have been feeling like I was 40. If I was still fucking around by 40, I would have felt like I was 60, you know? Like it takes more than it gives. That life takes more than it gives. That's a fact. You know, but, you know, and through all of that, you guys are, you're experiencing, you know, the repercussions of what I'm going through. And I'm young as a motherfucker. I'm young. You know what I mean? I'm fucking young as shit. You know? And, uh, yeah, I don't know if I ever apologized. You know what I mean? But I do, I apologize, man. You know, I apologize for subjecting y'all to that. I could have, even when I was doing what I was doing, I could have done it all better. You know, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. I could have, I could have done better. And I'm not saying that because of what I know now. I'm saying because of what I know, I knew then. You know, but it was always, you know, I'll do better next time. You know what I mean? Like, I got time, you know? And I was damn disciplined, but I was nowhere near as disciplined or as responsible as I could have been based upon 
my level of maturity and experience and knowledge, you know, at that point. I, I, I was underperforming all the time. And I don't really know why, you know, but I was underperforming. And I didn't understand the, the impact of that on my male offspring, you know, but it began to, it began to make sense once I saw your older brother going through the shit he was going through. And I recognized, oh, this nigga is trying to be me. He's trying to do what I do. If I don't stop, I got three more fucking sons who are gonna be doing the same fucking shit. And what can I say? That's how I know for sure that children will do what you do before they'll do what you say. You know? And it was important to me that I stop that legacy. It was important to me that it not continue on, you know? Two generations before me and then me, I think that was enough. I would hate for you and your brothers to be in the fucking street. I would hate that. That's bullshit, you know what I mean? It's like, what was it all fucking for? Just so we can go around in circles. Now I'm the top dog. I got the juice now. <laughs> That's true. That's it. That's that shit. That's that shit for real. How long we been on here, man? Uh, hour and a half. Yeah. I mean that's cool. Yeah. We gotta chop this joint up, man. Get these motherfuckers highlights. Yeah, I got you. I got you, man. All right. For real, for real. Yeah. I appreciate it, Brown. Like it, this is uh this is super dope. You know what I'm saying? Um, we popping son is gonna be unlike anything because, um, you know, motherfuckers like father and sons who've had the kinds of like y'all. We grew up together. Yeah, for real. You know, like what I mean? playing in the house, water yeah. fights, nerf fights, yeah. wrestling, like yeah. looking at bitches. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we grew up together. Nigga, you know? I remember what you remember we was in a hotel. We was in a hotel, we watching TV and shit, and a dude came by on TV, he had muscles. And I said, ooh. And they said, ooh, what you mean, ooh? Like, <laughs> oh yeah. Like that. <laughs> Yo, I mean, ooh, I meant like, damn, that nigga was big, and these niggas like, nah, that nigga said, ooh. Y'all <laughs> yeah, remember that. Like, oh shit, I, like, I remember, remember that. that. Oh, we like gave you the business. So was so oh, mad. we gave him the business. Like, nah, <laughs> like, like, whole time, every time somebody took their clothes off, they were like, you don't like me too, right? You don't like me, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> they start wearing their towel, you know, they wear their towel running waist. Oh, they pull the up here. Like, don't look at me, nigga. <laughs> yo, yo, we was, uh, it was extraordinary, man. Like, I, I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change anything, man. We had an extraordinarily good time, and, and I was fortunate that I didn't put y'all through what I had been put through. You know, y'all didn't have to go visit nobody in jail, and you didn't have to come to no motherfucking funeral home and look at my motherfucking dead body. And I, I would do that three fucking times. I mean, you transitioned to something amazing, too, so that was dope. And yeah, 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 that was dope. That was dope, you know. And, and you know, you're talking about the Don Diva thing, and... and Doing that was so pivotal because it was two things. One, when I decided I wasn't gonna be in the street anymore and it's the only thing I'd ever done, it was like, okay, that, that's like, it's like, well, I'm just gonna throw away the last 17 and a half years of my life. Just gonna walk away from it and start all fucking over. And I was like, that shit feels so wrong. It feels so wrong to not be able to salvage anything from all that I had been through. And that's why I began writing the introspection that was my personal journal that ended up becoming Raised by Wolves. It did start out as being Raised by Wolves. You remember when I used to be in my office and y'all used to be in the living room watching um, South Park. Watching South Park. When it first started, like season one, South Park. <laughs> and, and I'm in my I'm in my office and shit. And and they're in the living room down the hall. And I can I can hear them. And I hear, oh you son of a bitch! Oh you fucking I'm like, what what the what the fuck am I 
you been watching? What the what the fuck are you watching? You know? But I was in there not knowing I was in there planting the seeds for uh, Don Diva magazine and um, and ultimately for, you know, Raised by Wolves and oh, Gangsters and Young Guns and Get Smart and 50 Critical Quotes, like all of those things all came from the experiences I had in the street, in my family, before I got in the street, you know, and basically I was able to salvage something from something I'd given my entire fucking life to. And that meant a lot, it meant a lot to me. And um, to be able to share that experience with y'all. Yeah, that was dope. And take y'all awesome. with me. That was experience, that was, it was important. To be able to watch you build the business from the ground up and just, you know, just move. And be humble enough to stand out there and do every single thing Every job title in that business, you did it. So yep. we did it. Yep. So it was just like, you know, the experience I got. I said to somebody the other day, I was like, yo, I could really be taking pictures from one of these professional magazines. And I yep. just never, like, put together a resume to, like, apply for. I was like, I, there's so many jobs I could have because of the skills I've gained from just doing that and experience. So, yep. you know, yep. it just gave me a leg up. Not to mention the degree of socialization. Yeah. You know? all kinds of people, all kinds of environments, you know, knowing how to speak, when to speak, who to speak to, and, and, and how to speak to who you're speaking to, and knowing that, you know, this kind of conversation is not necessarily the kind of conversation you would have with this person. Going from one into uh, one of a room to the other end of the room and, and being able to adapt to the differences between one and the other, stuff like that in real time. I mean, those, those are extraordinary experiences for young black males from fucking South Bronx and Harlem. Yeah, like that. that's what you know I always mean? remind myself. I'd be like, yeah, you from Florida. Yeah. <laughs> like, you from, you from yeah. Andrews. Right, right, you know? And um, um, also the, what was the other thing I want to say? The, uh, the, 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 the nature of what I did, right? Coming up in an environment and a home where I had lots of money, and then growing up and becoming, a, you know, a young hustler, and lots of money, and then retiring from that and becoming, you know, a, a non-street person, and recognizing something that I didn't recognize before that getting those amounts of money without taking that degree of risk wasn't as easy I did not know if I had known I probably wouldn't have been able to do it I was so unacclimated unfamiliar with the real world I had no idea how difficult it was especially at that time to make legitimate money at that level when I told my partner, I said, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And you know, after he stopped laughing, he was like, so what you gonna do? I said, I got no idea, man, but you know, I'm gonna be all right and I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure it out. But I had no, I was, I, I was naive. I had no idea that, you know, there weren't a lot of things that a young, you know, high school dropout with no kind of job experience, no kind of resume, I never did nothing. I had no idea, not that I was thinking about getting a job, but I had no idea that, you know, getting your hands on tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars legitimately was not remotely an easy task. Not remotely. I had no idea. If I did, I would have been apprehensive. I'd have been like, whoa, how the fuck am I gonna take care of my people and my family? You know what I mean? So, you know, um, I would have gone back. If I had done anything else, I would have gone back. But because I did something that constantly reminded me of what it was I had escaped, because I was constantly doing stories on my former cohorts and comrades and associates and family members, I was constantly reminded of how far, I read the motherfucker's transcripts, I read his charges, I read his case, and I'd be like, that could happen to me. 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 And I was constantly reminded of how fucking fortunate I was. If I had done anything else, the further I got from the 
that feeling that I described, the day that I got that text that said 911 and I called and they said they got him and I was like, my world is over. And the whole bottom fell out. The further I got from that feeling, the more I would have forgotten that feeling, which was the base motivation for me wanting to remove myself from being subjected to that. And um, if I hadn't done Don Diva and did those kinds of stories, I would have forgotten that adventure. I would have been less connected to that feeling and more connected to the feeling of, man, this ain't me. I gotta get some fucking money, man. Fuck this bullshit. You know what I'm saying? I gotta get some money. This ain't me. And every time I said that to myself and thought about calling and saying, yo, I need 20 real quick, it was like, no, I'm cool. <laughs> Read this nigga transcript. It's like, yeah, his, his mother told on him. His brother told on him. I'm like, yeah. the connect, the nigga you buying the work from, told on you. What the fuck? Like, I didn't even leave the goddamn place where I'm transacting my primary business. I'm, I'm going to my resource. My resource is telling on me? What the fuck am I going to do with that? If the nigga you buying the work from is Walmart telling on you, Walmart telling on you. Yeah. How the fuck? But if that's what it is, and that's what it was, that's what it turned into. The Connects was working with the police. They sold all the drugs in the world, and they giving them to anybody and everybody. And every now and then, it's like, uh, y'all need somebody? Uh, okay, this guy, you know, he 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 does about, you know, fifty a week. He's a good one. He'll look good on your resume. Yeah, take him. He's coming tomorrow when he leaves, I'll call you, you just pop him, you know what I'm saying? You know, that's that. That's what it was. So I knew, I said, there's no going back. The world I come from is over. This is just some reasonable, not even reasonable facts and some bullshit fucking copy. And um, so that was, that was what kept me out, man. Like, fate was really, really on my side, you know? And uh, that's why there's no, no struggle that I can't withstand because I know what the alternative could be. I was constantly reminded of what the alternative could be. Constantly reminded of where I could have been. And I couldn't imagine myself uh, in nobody's cage. I don't belong in nobody's motherfucking cage. You know what I mean? Um, speaking about that feeling, that despondent feeling of like, oh shit, is all like, it's like you can't even touch the world anymore. You can't even touch your world anymore. Like that's how I felt that day when I when I spoke to Mark and he said, "Yo, they got them people got and life as you know it is over." Echoed in my head. And as I'm riding down the highway at 55 miles an hour, and I'm just looking, everything, everything is just everything is standing out. You know. The trees, the sun, the sky, everything. Everything means more all of a sudden. Everything. Every little fucking thing. And I'm just trying to take it all in because I don't know what's going to happen. The last time I saw Meech, we were at Visions. It was Usher and Jeezy's all-black birthday party. And I come in through the front and I got a security guy in front of me, security guy in back of me. Obviously, Usher at his height, Jesus at his height, the place is packed, right? So they pushing through, getting me through, and I look up to where the DJ booth was. And Frank Ski was doing his thing, whatever, whatever, and we used to be in this little section right next to that, yeah. right? And I look up, and it's like a story and a half, like, you know, second floor from the ground. I look up, and it's all these people in the pack. And dude is like this. He's looking out over the crowd like this. He's like that. It's that far away look. And I recognize that look. It took me right back to that day, the gas station that morning. I was like, that, that is the worst fucking. There's no amount of money worth that shit right there that he's going through right now. And I know what the fuck it is. And anybody who's been through what I'm talking about knows what the fuck I'm talking about. 
it's the worst thing ever. It's like hearing the worst news you can hear, whatever that might be to you. And it's nothing you can do about it. And I look up and I'm just looking at him and I'm like, yeah, I'm seeing what I'm thinking I'm seeing. Yeah. Oh, you can't open it. Oh, you need me to open it? No, I can't open it. Okay. You need me to open it? Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. He, um... <laughs> peace. <laughs> so, he, um... You know, he, he looks over. He's looking, 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 and then we, can't, we make eye contact. And I look at him, and he looks at me, and I look at him, I go... And it's like, in that moment, it's like, yeah, man. Yeah, this was good while it lasted. And, you know, I went up there, we kicked it and whatever, whatever. And when the shit was over, I think Cliff was with him. I think Cliff was with him. He's still, you know, he's still holding him down there. And um, y'all seen Cliff in um, the, the, the Blowing Money Fast uh, documentary on stars. And, um, um, he, they were, we were walking down the street, walking to the cars and shit like that. And I said, all right, bro, I see you later. And, and I knew, I said, I'm not going to see him again. You know, not no time soon. And uh, there weren't, like, any open, active warrants or nothing for him at this point, whatever. But it was right there. It was right there. And right after that, Started kicking in fucking doors and running motherfuckers down and locking everybody fucking up and yeah, it was it was crazy and then they, I don't know maybe a month later um, yeah they, they 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 got them you know and um, again I was reminded of how great my fortune is you know to never have lost a day with my sons you know what I'm saying. Um, and that I've lost a day with my, with my freedom. I'm very, very fortunate. And that's why I'm trying to tell you motherfuckers, you better listen to what the fuck I'm talking about, goddammit, because if you don't, you're gonna be fucked. <laughs> you know, but, yeah, man. Yeah, man. So, this was, uh, this was pretty dope. I had no... You know, I, I don't ever really know what we're going to talk about. When we get on here, it's just, we've been through a lot of shit, so, <laughs> Definitely. you know, I don't ever really know what we're going to talk about, you know, but um, um, whatever it is, it's going to be honest, it's going to be genuine, it's going to be real, um, and not hyperbole, uh, ain't nothing getting gassed up for your entertainment, um, we, are, we are not entertainers, um, we're educators. Essentially, you know, I mean, he's an entertainer, you know, what I mean, but you know, this is for really educational educational purposes and Hopefully willfully you guys have taken away something of value from it, you know, and um, we haven't even scratched the surface Realistically, like we really haven't But y'all be good man. Y'all have a good weekend and Be safe and be productive. Remember I said, you know, read something man learn something the world is changing very rapidly and we as uh, melanated people to be really honest with you are the least prepared we are the absolute least prepared the world is changing in ways that you know most of the people alive today unless they're in their 70s uh, 80s have never seen before you guys on the political, on a global scale, on a global level, the global economic level, there are things happening, man, that when your children and their children, when your children are adults and their children are, you know, young, young people, they're going to look back at this time and be like, was that, is that real? Did that really happen? Was it really like that? And yeah. It's gonna be some different shit, man. And so many of us are so uninformed and so um, misinformed and so distracted that we're not even almost prepared. We're in a lot of fucking trouble. I shit you not. 
we're in a lot of trouble, you know. Um, thanks, Pablo, for boss mindset. He said, great analogy. I appreciate that, man. Um, so, man, just tap in with us again on Tuesday, man. Remember, we popping, son. I'm pop. I'm the son. And, um, you know, this is what it is, man. So, y'all enjoy yourself. Enjoy your weekends. Be safe wherever you are. You know what I mean? And uh, we'll see you again on Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. We out here at Grind. All right. How do I cut this? How do I cut this goddamn thing off? Press the button. Where the hell? Where are you guys? The X.